It is how cities and states respond. And uh, we're gonna get started in two seconds here. I wanna just make sure that folks know that the best idea is to go into the right-hand corner where it says view and click on speaker view because we're not able to highlight people in breakout rooms. So if you hit speaker view, that'll keep you from being distracted from everything else. I also wanna remind folks to put yourselves on mute if you're not speaking and uh, we'll get started. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining How Cities and States Respond in Zoom Room A. My name is Ann English and I'm a founding board member of My Dog Is My Home. I'll be this session's moderator and I'm pleased to help guide this conversation as someone who's been developing and leading programs for over two decades in the homeless services sector. I've really witnessed the evolution in how people experiencing homelessness are served. In 2008, while working as the area, Hollywood area director for PATH, People Assisting the Homeless, and in partnership with PAWS LA, I oversaw the opening of the first companion animal program within an interim housing facility. Uh, the PATH Hollywood Petco Place was the first formally sanctioned companion animal program within a homeless shelter in Los Angeles. And uh, at the time it was pretty groundbreaking and it's just been amazing to see how much progress has been made um, over time. Uh, not only are uh, programs embracing the need to keep people and animal animals together, but you know, legislators and local and state governments have incorporated the human animal bond into their strategies to serve people experiencing homelessness and ultimately to end homelessness by ensuring that services are person-centered, trauma-informed and low barrier and including uh, companion animals. So to give you some concrete examples of the progress that has been made, we have three amazing speakers with us today to talk about co-sheltering from a policy and governance standpoint. Um, I'm excited to bring to you Patrick Kwan from the New York City Mayor's Office Heidi Marston from the Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority, and Becky Mo from the California Department of Housing and Community Development. And I believe that Becky's colleague, Todd Goodman from HCD will also be joining during the Q&A portion. So first up, we have Patrick Kwan. Uh, Patrick is a senior advisor at the New York City Mayor's Office of Community Affairs. His portfolio includes work around Asian American and Pacific Islanders, LGBTQIA+, and Animal Welfare Community Affairs. Prior to joining the New York City Mayor's Office, Patrick served in advocacy and communication leadership roles, including as Director of New York City Smoke Free, National Director of Grassroots Organizing for the Humane Society, and Field Organizer for Amnesty International. He currently serves as a board member of the New York State Tobacco Use Prevention and Control Advisory Board, a Sterling Network Fellow on Economic Mobility at the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation, and on the Stonewall Quarter Share Leadership Council at the Stonewall Community Foundation. Welcome, Patrick. We're looking forward to hearing about what's happening in New York City. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you all so much for being here. I'm very excited to see a lot of familiar names and familiar faces as well. Uh, and I think as Anne mentioned, and probably in my bio, uh, not only am I a city bureaucrat, but I also uh, am an animal person and have a very long background in working in animal advocacy in my previous roles, uh, working at the Humane Society United States, where I was New York State Director, and also as National Director of Grassroots Organizing work in animal advocacy work. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for being here today, as well as all the conference organizers and sponsors for making this event happen. And I, one of the things that's like really funny, I think when I was chatting with Christine uh, Kim, uh, who uh, also, as some of you may know, uh, served uh, in the SD liaison for animal welfare issues and director of the mayor's office for animal welfare in New York City uh, in the de Blasio, the previous administration. Uh, for here. And um, 
one of the things that so much that she has, and she's really, I think she actually is here. I think I saw her perhaps, that she is in a way a very amazing expert in this. And, uh, and we have so many advocates uh, who are here, uh, who basically know a lot more and been able to work on this. So I've only been talking more from my advocacy on a government hat side, uh, because so many people um, have been involved in making some of this work. And uh, I always was also hoping that we would have some exciting announcements that we'll have, but we're not currently ready to share uh, some of those currently, but I hate to bet that person to stay tuned, uh, but stay tuned. Uh, so what I can share, um, probably a little bit of background uh, for it, is that pets are currently not welcome at uh, New York City. Um, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that they are not there. And that's something that I always talk about with my colleagues who are in government who may not that they are anti-animal people or not, you know, they may not be animal people, but they just kind of go like, well, it's just not there. And what I try to emphasize that, that just because they are not welcome doesn't mean that they are not there. And having the, uh, some of the uh, basically program support and also leadership buy-in and also just having the simple SOPs, the standard operating procedures of how we can actually make uh, what's already happening. Uh, to actually be better uh, would not only be helping preserving the human animal bond, but also operations and programs and all of that. And so currently they're not welcomed and obviously not there, not necessarily not there in the shelters, the drop-in centers and transitional housing uh, in the city of New York. And uh, what thing that was very exciting that happened in the last year uh, is that the New York City Council uh, passed a couple of uh, bills and legislation uh, to basically, uh, one, to require for the uh, New York City uh, agencies to develop a plan for how to accommodate pets and get having them uh, welcomed, and two, tracking the data and info of how many folks who are in shelters who may have pets and people who may be turned away, for example, and all of that, and also just doing a survey in, in, in ways of making sure that there's a count and number and having them reported. And that allows for some groundwork uh, that you know are like informal, but now that is codified into law that allows us to do some of that work. And uh, third, um, you know, due to the many of the efforts uh, of some of, of the folks who are here, um, you know, there is a pilot project currently going on uh, that to started to basically have the beginning conversations and the folks at uh, NIDIS, the New Yorkers and um, New Yorker Interfaces After Network and uh, all the folks who've been leading that project. And there's so many folks who are in New York City and I'll definitely get in trouble for probably forgetting someone um, in terms of getting, uh, you know, the folks including the uh, at Animal Haven, at ASPCA, Pause New York, uh, the Mayor's Alliance and all of it. And I can't wait to get text messages from folks where I forget the thank yous. But one thing that I would say is that one thing that's very exciting for some of that work, and I see my former colleague or former New Yorker, Allison Cardona is here as well. Uh, a lot of the uh, work uh, basically help happened, um, you know, the groundwork was under the animal planning task force uh, that was launched like after Hurricane Katrina. Allison uh, and I, back when we were puppies, um, we are both older than we look, I would have to say. <laughs> So, at least for Allison, so for, for that for us. So uh, Allison was at the ASPCA and I was at the Humane Society and uh, we oftentimes, I have to say that we were the, uh, you know, oftentimes the only person of color uh, who were uh, representing organizations, the animal organizations who were there. And Allison and I uh, served on the animal planning task force that many of you may remember um, was codifying into law after Hurricane Katrina when people were not allowed to bring their pets with them. Um, many advocacy organizations uh, advocated to make sure that the um, FEMA and uh, folks are required, and ex especially locally, that there needs to be a plan to be developed. Uh, to make sure that we bring together advocacy organizations, animal protection organizations, the social service partners, uh, the Red Cross, for example, and folks to plan for how to accommodate uh, pets in moments of disaster, in moments of evacuation and all that work. And so this is like a very early on, um, you know, uh, under the New York City Office of Emergency Management that they were required by federal law to develop a plan and to also develop the 
uh, the the coordination and having the time that the uh, the agency, the Office of Emergency Management, was putting together, having staff time to make sure that they bring all the players together, so we're not scrambling when a hurricane happens, when another disaster happens, or evacuation, or a thing happened. Uh, so those were some of the early work that happened. And one thing that I, you know, that kind of reminds me a lot of some of that work, and I kind of refer to it both, is that these are like very similar in the way of what we're trying to do in New York is that one is developing a plan. It's just that, you know, a lot of folks when they have uh, folks who have concerns about accommodating pets um, uh, in shelters is that they are like, whoa, you know, this sounds weird and I don't know how I'm gonna make this happen because there's so little resources and there's so many uh, things like that. And this is exactly why having a plan and having pilot projects matter a ton. Uh, especially that, you know, in New York City, one of the things that uh, folks uh, sometimes forget is that at least in the city of New York, that our budget for the city of New York is actually bigger than 46 other states um, in the country. So only four of the countries, uh, I mean, four of the states have a bigger budget than the state of New York, and uh, city of New York, I'm sorry, and uh, for that. So uh, we have a very large population and all of it. And uh, actually, definitely a shout out to Jenny Coffey, who's currently at Animal Haven, who's been a consistent member from all the way from the beginning of Animal Planning Task Force uh, in Office of Emergency Management. Uh, so some of that work of laying the groundwork that allow us to develop a plan, having the pilot projects, and also it basically builds buy-in and for us to also develop that data and uh, for that work, uh, making the case for it. I mean, as we all know, uh, you know, the rough stats of like maybe perhaps half of the uh, households have like at least one pet and many of whom who have pets tend to have more than one. It's an accommodation that needs to happen uh, for it because, you know, people who have the trauma of experiencing chronic homelessness, they should not also be um, experiencing the trauma of having a family member taken away or to be refused uh, with some of that work. And so we were able to basically put together some of it. And a lot of times when we, uh, for me, having both my, you know, my city government hat on as well as my animal advocate hat on, uh, sometimes it's, you know, one and the same. It's basically talking about um, the cases that we have is like, hey, we have under emergency management, we understand that in emergency situations, homelessness is an emergency situation. It's also a disaster. It's also all of it. And it's something that needs to be solved. We recognize in emergency management and emergency planning, the importance of keeping families together, including their pets, because we understand the trauma of separation of having their furry or scaly or feathered, also gonna get in trouble for not remembering uh, our many animal companions uh, for that. And uh, this really helps some of the folks who have to make the policies, the folks who are you know, implementing the operations, implementing some of their programs to understand and kind of like, whoa, it's not as new as folks expect. Uh, because sometimes, uh, you know, many of us are in meetings, you know, whether it be like Jenny or Allison or all of us in all these years and uh, who are there uh, for these meetings, including uh, Katharina, I think maybe she may be here uh, from uh, NIDIS, is that, you know, sometimes folks are more interested in finding that I think what my uh, former boss would say about like zebra scenarios where they go like, well, what if someone brings an ostrich? What if someone brings an alligator? Actual questions that have happened before. And when really the question that we want people to be able to get to is how we can make this work and how we can make it better. And we need to get people to that place. And one thing that I always share that I think it's hilarious, at least to my end, is that shortly after the PETS Act uh, was passed, uh, which is the PETS uh, Pets Emergency Transportation Safety Act, I believe that's what it stood for after Katrina, making sure FEMA and disaster partners and local agencies were required to plan and accommodate for pets. Uh, I was invited to speak at a Red Cross conference about, uh, and the title of the talk was, why include pets in disaster planning and evacuations? And I said, and I was given, I think 40 minutes to do that talk and I, was very tempted to say because we made it law 
and then just walk off the stage. But that's not what I did. <laughs> but that's what I really wanted to do because that was the truth uh, in that. <laughs> exactly, Hilbert. It's like complete mic drop, but you know, we we figured that it wouldn't uh, do you want that? But then it's one of those discussions that we had, understanding for them, that especially during Hurricane Katrina, the lessons learned and how we could do that. Um, we still remember that it took years of implementation and planning, and it continues to this day, obviously, for everyone who's involved in that work, um, is that, you know, there are still um, you know, uh, little wrinkles that we need to iron out. There are things that we still need to work on, but by and far, in terms of uh, pets being included, pets uh, being planned for, is now just a standard. It's already happening. It's there. Yes, always room for improvements everywhere we have, but it's required, and that's some of the places we're getting to, and uh, we're hoping for for some of that work, and. Um, what I would say is that I would also, you know, because we currently don't have a huge uh, announcement that we can have right now that I wish we could have, uh, is that, you know, uh, in New York City, I think we, um, you know, like to basically hopeful that, you know, we basically are kind of implementing some of these work. I was the uh, director of Am I Still Smoke Free? Uh, when I work on my tobacco control and public health angle. So the city of New York was one of the biggest cities and also one of the first major cities to implement tobacco control. And we did a lot of technical assistance work uh, to basically assist other cities, including other countries, uh, to help implement smoke-free policies to make sure that there are smoke-free restaurants and bars and spaces and all of that stuff. But I'm very excited to actually listen to our friends at uh, Los Angeles Home Service, uh, Heidi and also Becky from there, because I know that you folks have been basically been doing it this year and we're just very, very excited to learn about what you folks are doing from the other coast uh, that some would say the best coast, but we can argue with that on another side uh, for it. Uh, so uh, I won't hold up any more time and I'll, I'll look forward to questions and things like that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patrick. Really appreciate it. Um, and excited to hear about the big announcements that we haven't heard <laughs> that we will hear. Um, you know, New York City uh, being the biggest city uh, in the country is, you know, really a model for the rest of the country. So it's great to hear that there is progress being made. And, um, you know, the West Coast, which I will say is the best coast, I am on the West Coast. Um, you know, has a very different way of dealing with homelessness uh, than New York City uh, in general. And I think it'll be really interesting to engage further uh, in the Q&A. Um, but next up, we have Heidi Marston. Heidi is the Executive Director of the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, where she serves as a leader in the effort to reduce homelessness across greater Los Angeles. She sits on the Leadership Alliance for the National Alliance to End Homelessness and served on the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Agency Review Team for the Biden-Harris presidential transition. Um, Heidi joined LASA in February 2019 after serving for over a decade at the U.S. Veterans Affairs in several different roles, including Director of Community Re Engagement and Reintegration and a Special Assistant to the VA Secretary under President Obama. Heidi lives in Los Angeles with her partner, her two rescue dogs, and a rotating door of foster dog guests. Thanks so much for joining us, Heidi. Please take it away. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks so much for having me. Um, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, I did put some slides forward. Um, if we don't have them, that's fine, too. I can just kind of talk through a little bit of this and, and follow Patrick's lead. I think we do have the slides. Go ahead. Okay. Would you like me to start sharing them? That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. And I won't, I won't take too long. I'll go through them quickly, but I thought it'd be just like good kind of grounding for folks um, who might not be as familiar with the landscape in Los Angeles um, around homelessness and some of the work we're doing. Um, so if you could go, I think there's a few slides before this. There we go. Cool. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our system design, um, what we know that it takes to actually address homelessness in any region, um, and then really where animal welfare fits in and some of those connections that we want to be really intentional about making. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, I think first and foremost, it's important for all of us to recognize that being unhoused in America, America is not a character flaw or an individual shortcoming. 
it's a grave policy and system failure and specifically a uh, emergency that started 40 years ago that led to where we are today. Um, so knowing all of this and knowing that this is something that not did not happen overnight, it becomes even more imperative that the way that we design our systems, our responses, our shelters, really create a no wrong door approach um, that have low barriers to entry, which you heard Patrick talk about, um, and that consider the entire family unit recognizing the trauma that these individuals have already been through and not wanting to re-traumatize um, unnecessarily. Next slide. So sometimes I know folks, mine included, my eyes glaze over a little bit when I talk about big systems and system failure and system work and what that means. Um, so I always like to talk about systems and think of them as like shadow monsters. Um, if you think of a shadow monster, this is a little sketch that my team put together, but the idea is like, these are shadow monsters that exist. They have influence, but they're elusive. They're hard to see. They're hard to pin down unless you're paying attention to it. And the shadow monsters that really disrupt our systems um, lead to the things, that, the challenges we see today in our society, like racism, like homelessness, like a lack of social safety nets and housing costs and criminal justice. All of those things are influenced by these, these other powers and forces. Um, so what I always remind myself and my team of is that every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it does. Um, so if we don't like what we're seeing, we need to change the system. Um, if we don't like seeing homelessness on the street, we need to change the systems that are driving it and are causing it. Um, and it goes with animal welfare as well. Um, it's really across the board. Next slide. And then just to give you a little landscape of California relative to the rest of the country in our unhoused population, there are about 151,000 individuals experiencing homelessness in California. Uh, 66,000 or so are in LA County, which is where LASA, uh, my agency has jurisdiction, um, relative to about 568,000 nationwide. And just caveating that this number is pre-COVID. Um, so there is a homeless count that just happened um, over the past few months and new data will be coming up, but this is what the world looked like uh, pre-COVID and really haven't gone back since. Next slide. So what we know is in any system, in any community, there are always three pillars to really addressing homelessness. And so I think part of the challenge here is figuring out how we weave the animal welfare work and the recognition of the family unit into all three of these elements. So the first one, and you'll see a lot of parallels here too, which I actually like to see. So if you go to the next slide, the first pillar, we talk about a lot in animal welfare, we talk about it a lot in homelessness, but it's about prevention. Um, so in Los Angeles, our latest data showed that every single day, 205 people found housing, they moved from the street into a permanent home, and that every single day, 225 people fell into homelessness. So the rate that people were falling in was faster. And I like to use the analogy of a bathtub where you, know, you walk into your bathroom, your bathtub is overflowing, there's water all over the floor. What's the first thing that you would do? Uh, you wouldn't start mopping up the floor, you would turn off the faucet. Um, similar to animal welfare individuals, if we want to really address this issue, we have to look at the root causes of why people are becoming homeless, um, why people are relinquishing their pets, why those units are breaking up in the first place. And I think we have a lot of um, good data on that that we can extrapolate across both systems to learn lessons um, from each other on that. Next slide. The other thing that's important to remember here is that um, homelessness is really the slow fade. And so when you think about folks who you pass by on the street, um, we, we see people who are at their lowest point, um, potentially in their entire life, but it doesn't happen overnight. Um, just like pets being relinquished doesn't happen overnight, right? So there are many systems that have to fail you before you literally have no other choice but to sleep on the sidewalk. And just thinking about it for yourself, putting yourself in someone's shoes, if you lost your job tomorrow, um, how long could you live in the housing that you have um, without needing to move or go somewhere cheaper? Um, how long would you need to live uh, with no income or, or relatively low income? Um, how, how long could you live there before you ran out of resources? How many friends or family members could you stay with before you literally have no other option um, but to sleep on the sidewalk? So these are people who have been marginalized and impacted by systems that were really designed to keep them out in the first place um, from the beginning. 
it's also why, especially across the country, but just in LA alone, if you are a black individual, you are four times more likely to be homeless than your white counterpart. Um, so these systems and the shadow monsters that we talk about are elusive and they're, they're oppressive um, and they are the reason and the drivers that we see the disproportionate rates of, in, of, um, of homelessness and the systemic and institutional racism and how that affects it. Next slide. So to, of course, our first pillar really is stopping people from falling in, recognizing that people at their, are at potentially their lowest point in their life when they are unhoused. The second pillar to really address homelessness is, of course, rehousing. Um, you know, we talk about housing and shelter as a basic human need, as a fundamental human right. Um, it's something that many communities ac across the country have started to embrace around shelter, but really looking at housing, too, as a fundamental human right. Um, that everybody deserves a place to call home and addressing those needs. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to help somebody address their, their long-term needs, their career aspirations, whatever the goals are that they have, if you don't have a place where you can just take a shower every day, where you have a door that locks, that has that safety and security. So recognizing the humanity in that um, and the long road that folks have ahead is really important as we think about how do we design responses to the homelessness crisis um, and of course, a huge part of that is keeping units together um, so that we're not re-traumatizing people as they go through the system. Next slide. And then the third pillar to really addressing uh, homelessness seems easy, but it is housing supply, right? You need to stop people from falling in. If they do fall in, you need a system that can move them inside. And then you, you need houses to put them into. Um, that is easier said than done in places like LA, California, but even across the country. Um, and our most recent data showed that just on the West Coast in California alone, there are only 30 affordable units for every 100 households that need them. So it's a, like a really bad game of musical chairs where the people who are the most vulnerable and the most in need of getting inside are potentially left out. Um, and until we figure out a way to create more options for people that they can afford to live in, um, we're gonna continue to see this cycle. Um, and that goes for animal welfare too. And I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit later um, about how we can help tie those two things together. Next slide. So what does it have to do with animal welfare? These are just some pictures, my outreach teams. We have um, outreach workers that really that go out on the front lines here in LA. And when I go out with them, they always make fun of me and they put a kennel in the back of my car because I always find animals and pets um, who are in encampments or unhoused or who people can't take care of anymore. Um, and we get them into care, but it's really about that holistic approach. So first of all, you know, when you're out there and you're talking to folks who are unhoused, I find that more often than not, um, the way to quickly build trust with people is through their pet. Um, it's through the, you know, talking to the guy who can't leave his encampment because somebody chained his dog to a fence that he can't get unlocked and figuring out how we do that and then figuring out the shelter piece. So figuring out if somebody doesn't want help for themselves, then let's figure out how we get vet care or food for your animal. And then we'll work on what that means for you longer term. So being really creative about how we build trust with people and recognizing the value of using um, animals and pets as a pathway to building a more sustainable, uh, trusting relationship with the individual is huge. Um, and that comes with the requirement, right, that we need, um, we need access to those services uh, more broadly as a homeless response system, um, particularly recognizing that we know that people surrender their pets for only a few reasons. It's that they don't have housing options, that there's a financial or medical barrier, or there's a behavioral barrier. So thinking about pre prevention differently and those things being solvable and equipping folks along the entire system to help address it, as opposed to waiting until they can access the animal welfare system, I think is really a force multiplier and a huge opportunity for us um, to meet people where they are and to keep these units together. Next slide. And then finally, some other ways of where to start. So um, I, I saw Allison Cardona is on the call. She's formerly from LA County. Um, but one of the best things that we have done here in Los Angeles is just started having conversations. So LASA, we are called a continuum of care. Every uh, region in the country has a continuum of care lead, meaning that the Depart Department of Housing and Urban Development 
has designated that entity, that organization as the lead for the homelessness response in your community. So my challenge to everybody here is if you don't know, find out who your local homelessness lead is, um, find your local nonprofit who's working in homelessness and ask for a meeting and start figuring out those intentional connection points that you can start making, no matter how large or small they are. Um, because even in a few conversations that we've been able to have in LA, we're seeing that there's a lot of work in prevention and diversion that our homeless system is doing. And models that we have tried that really work that could easily be translated into prevention and diversion of animals and pets into the shelter system or into the welfare system. Um, the connections to veterinary care being a larger connection to the human. Um, we've also figured out a lot of what we need to work on around advocacy. So there are huge barriers around landlord discrimination, particularly for low income housing. So if you think about the slide before that said there's only 30 available units for 100 households, there are even less available units for people who have a pet or a companion animal. Um, so thinking about how do we create the no wrong door approach? How do we think about housing as a human right? we pull back those layers and we make sure that people get to bring all of their family members with them, whether that's through an emotional support letter or something else. But those, those conversations and that work starts with just one meeting and one conversation to get to know each other. And then the options are endless. So um, it sounds really easy, I, I think, but it is kind of challenging, right? To reach out and make those intentional connections, but it, it makes so much sense for both spaces. And so I really encourage folks to do that. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me too if you don't know who that is in your region. Um, I'm happy to connect you, but there is so much opportunity here for us to, again, be force multipliers and to leverage the resources that we all have um, to make successful impact and true impact for both the pets uh, and the individuals that we're serving. That concludes my part, Anne. Of course, I'm talking on mute as usual. <laughs> Thanks so much, Heidi. That was fantastic. And, um, you know, I love your call to action around, you know, everybody kind of go out and do your advocacy and get to know the people because in the, tr you know, the truth is at, with my dog is my home as well. We really believe that this is, you know, weaving together a couple of different um, uh, sectors and understanding that housing and homelessness, animal welfare, everything is connected and collective impact is the only way to really find a solution. We have to do it together. So really appreciate that. And, you know, know that um, my dog is my home was really active in a conversation with Lawson in like 2017 with a request for bids uh, to expand animal accommodations in crisis and bridge housing. And so it's just great to see this really intentional focus. Um, so, so excited for what's gonna happen. Um, so uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have Becky Mo. Uh, Becky is a program manager for the California State Department of Housing and Community Development. She's passionate about making an impact and resolving homelessness issues. And she started her career at HCD in 2017 and joined the homelessness branch in 2020. She is also the proud mother of two dogs. Thanks for joining us, Becky. Well, thank you so much, Anne. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to meet you all during the conference. Yeah, thank you for my slide. <laughs> so these are my two babies, two big babies at home. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it is very inspiring to see so many people organizations and government agencies who are willing to come together, share experiences, learn from each other, and try to lower the barrier of animal policies in shelters and housing. And again, my name is Becky Mo. I'm a program manager for the PATH program. That is, for, uh, that is short for Pet Assistant and Support Program. And I come from the Department of Housing and Community Development. And during the past two years, I have worked on multiple programs that provide loans and grants to allow Californians access and maintain housing stability. And growing up, dogs have been my best companions. Currently, I have a golden retriever and a husky 
who helped me get through the stress caused by the pandemic. They are also my lifesaver. On New Year's Eve of 2020, an intruder tried to break into my house through the sliding door. It was my dogs who chased the intruder up to the roof, which gave me a chance to call the police. So truly after, after that incident, I start to consider them more than a pet, like more like a family member. And I would never move to a better community if it means that I have to abandon my dogs. No one can separate us. So I'm pretty sure like many people share the same view with me. And that is why we constantly see people walking away from shelters because they couldn't move in together with their pets. Housing pets can be challenging and, and costly to shelters. And that is why the pet assistant and support program, in short, the PASS program came into place. So instead of allocating funds to build more shelters and affordable units, the program really concentrates on resolving the root of the program, of, of the problem. Next slide, please. So in 2019, Senate Bill 109 authorized approximately $5 million to the PASS program to provide shelter, food, basic veterinary services for PASS owned by people experiencing homelessness moving into a shelter. The funds also cover the cost of staffing and the liability insurance related to providing these services. So basically the grants should be uh, spent on pets and should be pet related. And the eligible applicants are cities, counties, and nonprofit organizations within California. And during round one, the PASS program received 49 applications requesting more than $9 million. And after reviewing and scoring the applications, our program awarded 28 applications and each awardee received grants up to $200,000. So as you all know, the US shut down early 2020 due to the initial outbreak of COVID and many shelters had to adjust their policies to best protect the current participants. So the awardees um, of the past program encountered difficulties in expanding the grants due to the pandemic. And Department of Housing and Community Development is aware of the challenge and the state grant management team from the department worked hard with awardees to assist them in every way possible. As of 2021, the past program has been successfully assisting 107 people and 113 pets. And of the 107 people with pets helped by the past program, 44 of them have gained additional skills and trainings which help them return to the workforce and gain income either from the work or public assistance. During the past two years, 14 people were able to transition to permanent housing. Next slide, please. Thank you. So HCD received so many positive feedbacks from awardees of the past program, program round one, so that the department give, um, uh, decided to um, decided to run another round of the past program. At the end of February, 2022, HCD released the notice of funding availability for the past program for another $10 million. So we just, re uh, we just released the notice of funding availability and the application will be due on April 8th and HCD will announce the awards on June 30th. The application review process is, uh, is on a competitive basis. 
So with the cost of living going up and the maximum award uh, amount for each application has increased to $600,000. And the applicants are encouraged to submit more than one application if they operate multiple shelters. So time is the key to be awarded, which means the earlier you submit a complete application, the better chances you'll be awarded for the grant. So you will be able to find more information on the HCD website. And uh, HCD will also hold a webinar right after the conference. So you can register for the webinar um, which will provide more detailed information about how to complete and submit your application for the grant. And we will also discuss about how to be successful in the competitive process. And the webinar will take place on March 8th. Next slide, please. So the application itself is simple. Basically, we are just collecting some some information, and we want to ensure that you can, um, you can, you can use the grants in a proper way. But if there's any technical assistance is needed, feel free to reach out to the past program. We are here to help. So I expect round two of the past program to be a greater success than round one. And I appreciate my dog is my home's invitation to speak on the conference as well as their technical support to our current and future awardees. Thanks everyone for your time. And I'm looking forward to receiving your application or working collectively with you to serve our community in the near future. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, California's Pet Assistance and Support Program is the only program of its kind that we're aware of. And, uh, you know, I can't, my dogs in my home can't say enough uh, just how much we support it. It's incredibly meaningful that on a state level, not only is there support and recognition that keeping people and animals together in circumstances of homelessness is important, but it's, that it's actually funded. So thanks for being here today and for sharing with all of us a little more about your work. Um, so we're coming to the Q&A portion of our session. So I wanna invite audience members to drop your questions in the chat. Uh, and uh, while we're getting questions, <clears throat> I wanna just point out uh, that it's really significant in my mind that we have speaker representation in the session from New York City, Los Angeles and the state of California. And when you look at the numbers of homelessness across the country, these are the places that have the highest populations. And it's in these places that we're required to have the kind of innovation to do everything we can to end and prevent homelessness. Um, so I'm just gonna check out the chat, see if people have questions for the speakers. And maybe while you folks are thinking about that, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions. Um, Patrick, you had talked a little bit about kind of different types of challenges, um, getting a co-sheltering a pilot off the ground. Do you think those challenges have more to do with like the government process or is it about resources for caring for pets? Yes. <laughs> I think there's a uh, number of issues that I think many of whom are uh, there. I think it's a little bit of perhaps use another animal metaphor like a chicken or egg. In a way, we need, uh, you know, advocacy and animal groups to be able to advocate. We need uh, the government to basically to kind of help lead on policy. And uh, the perfect storm is that if we're able to kind of push the peanut forward, so to say, uh, I think across fronts, whether it's in the advocacy community, uh, the government standpoint, and also funders who kind of make it happen. Uh, and this is some of that work that I think, you know, from uh, initial conversations that are making it happen, uh, so the pilot project funding uh, that um, 
that has basically made happen and also all the animal groups and advocates who basically have been, you know, talking about this, advocating this for a long while. And I think it's, you know, it requires the leadership of, you know, people who are in government uh, to basically try to put that forward. And, you know, Christine, when she was director of the mayor's office for animal welfare, helped elevate this issue. And uh, we're very hopeful that in this new administration under Mayor Eric Adams, that we'll be able to do the same um, as we kind of push forward on uh, some of the animal welfare initiatives, which uh, definitely does include this issue. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I have a question in the chat. Thanks for all three panelists. Um, uh, what programs that accept pets, have you found the majority of people are able to utilize those services or resources? Or do you find that there are still barriers for many pet owners due to breed and weight restrictions? So that's an interesting question. If that comes up in LA or in, in any of the, I wonder how that's um, impacted or affected by the past program. Is there anything around that in there? Anybody jump in? Well, I can jump in uh, a little bit on that. So. Uh, for the past program, we received feedback from the awardees from round one that, you know, if the size of the dog or the pet is too big and the insurance wouldn't cover it, or they they, they are having a, can, um, a hard time in funding the behavioral support, they have to partner with like for example, SPCA, like another nonprofit or organization, because the shelter itself, normally they, you know, they serve people rather than pets. So they do need a, a partner with dedication to help both the pets and, and the humans. So normally speaking of the insurance, um, you know, like we would rather, we would rather give them a little bit more funds and have them switch to another, in, insurance company who will cover all, you know, all uh, dogs of all sizes. Right. Great. Yeah, and we could, and for the LA piece specifically, we see the same challenges. Um, I think we're, we try to be as flexible as possible. There's always concerns around liability. So we're trying to figure out the right kind of design. I think the other piece we're really paying attention to is where, um, at the state level or the federal level, even local level where legislation changes or um, amendments are unintentionally inhibiting the ability of our folks to get inside with pets. So recently in California, there was a change to the, um, the shelter um, or to the emotional support animal law, um, which was probably very well intended, but requires folks to be seeing a doctor for 30 days before they can get a note. Um, which is a huge issue for folks who are unhoused. And so we're trying to pay attention across the board of where those things are going to have unintended consequences and then really help our shelter providers um, and have had conversations with our animal services colleagues too about how they could help us with um, managing behavior challenges, managing environmental changes um, so that people bringing their pets in is not an impediment um, to their, their recovery, the help they need, um, and then to whatever their road to housing is. Right. Yeah. I see a note in the chat that uh, Arizona Governor Doug Ducey passed a law prohibiting discrimination in housing. Really? Wow. Um, that's awesome. So uh, Secretary Castro in his opening remarks talked a lot about advocacy and there's a question in here about advocacy. What type of advocacy folks feel is you know, most impactful for pushing forward um, co-sheltering programming and influence if people have ideas around local advocacy. No. No. And can we, uh, just a reminder, if you are not speaking, please put yourself on mute, thank you. Um, does anybody have uh, thoughts about that? types of advocacy that you uh, Yeah, I can go if it's okay. I think it also uh, bleeds into a little bit of the previous question as well. Uh, one of the things is I think when folks were looking for definitions about what breed and what size and what requirements there should be for creating a welcoming environment uh, for the homeless shelters and the uh, things like that, it, it's that we're able to basically point to what's existing. 
that when we have emergency evacuation under the Office of Emergency Management, just for consistency, we don't tell people that you're not allowed to bring a pit bull into evacuation center. We don't tell people that you're not allowed to bring a bird. You're not allowed to bring an ostrich. You know, ostrich is illegal, just <laughs> moving that. So uh, I, I think from sense of that, uh, we're able to basically having those examples. And this is where, you know, why this conference is so important. And also for that, uh, we're also able to point to our colleagues in other cities and other government and other states and other places to show that there is president. And there's also like not only president, but also models and different models for people to pursue. And uh, also I think, you know, as many folks in government and all that uh, folks are definitely, especially, you know, during the pandemic, I hate using after pandemic is that folks are, you know, exhausted and uh, uh, understaffed and all of it, and we're all exhausted uh, for some of it. It's just that if we have something that's available that could be like a model or something that's, a, you know, we can't always just copy and paste, but it basically makes it easier for everyone to adopt when we're able to point to examples and to be able to do that. That it's like, hey, you know, there are sample definitions, you know, that in terms of consistency. And for that, even though for someone who may feel like, oh, we shouldn't have pets who are over 35 pounds or that we should have that, that we're able to basically point out, well, well we want to make sure that there's consistency across programs and across agencies. And so when we do the emergency planning, we recognize that. And this is why that we need to make sure that there should be a more welcoming rather than restrictive definition. Yeah. And I would just add to, I know was, um, there was a question in the chat around the, you know, we're really moving to kind of a non-congregate sheltering model. So no longer the days of a bunch of cots or bunk beds, but with COVID, um, LA in particular has done a lot of tiny homes, a lot of hotels and motels. And we're really seeing across the board, which is no surprise um, that when people have uh, privacy, they have rooms that they can go to and lock the door. Um, people who have been really hesitant to go into shelter historically will go. Um, and that, you know, the dignity that is brought with that really increases the uptick. Um, but I think the other benefit that that has is around some of these policies where um, you're not having to worry about congregate spaces where people have pets potentially interacting. Um, you have much more privacy and the ability to kind of maintain your pets within your, your area. Um, so that's one side of it that I think it's just another benefit of this, like this more kind of dignified non-congregate model, even though it's more expensive, we see better outcomes across the board. Um, the other thing I would encourage is um, unfunded mandates. I think it's one thing to say we need to do this across the board, but then not equipping our nonprofit partners who are running shelters to understand what it means to have the access to dog runs or to kennels or veterinary, whatever those things are, recognizing it's not their wheelhouse. I think designing those connections is really important up front so that they feel equipped um, to implement or to roll out whatever the new standards are. Yeah, absolutely. And unabashed plug for both the Alliance's Pets and People Together uh, uh, booklet that My Dog is My Home helped with, and also a lot of stuff that we have uh, on our technical assistance side that we are just all about helping folks to do this well in any way that we can. So please reach out if you are in that space. Um, I'm wondering, is Todd on the on the line or no? Do we know Todd was going to be joining? I don't. I don't see him. Okay. Well, is it possible? Are you able to talk about some of the, you know, how you guys determined eligibility for funding and, um you know, what things, uh, you know, programs have been successfully using funding for? Yeah, so uh, for PASS, um, like in the very beginning, when we first designed a PASS program, and there is there was a big confusion about, you know, the grants can be used both on humans and also on PASS. And later, mm -hmm. we have to issue a memo to clarify that all the grants has to be used towards PASS or pa a PASS related. Right. So, you know, the eligible expenses, including, you know, if you know, uh, it, like previously, if you, if you don't serve um, PASS, 
And now it is time for you to buy crates and kennels because you know in the emerging shelters, like many of them, they they use they use a shared room. So you you need to make sure like when you when the human being goes to sleep and your pets are being taken care of. So that's one of the you know the main eligible expenses. So we also allow the grants to be spent on the food and the um and the behavioral support. And also, you know, if you if you if your staff doesn't have experiences in handling pets, and now it is time to hire additional staff to you know to work together with other staff to support both the pets and the pet owner, and as well as oh, as well as the insurance. That's a big part for the shelters because they want to make sure everything you know in the future can be covered. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and um, so I think like Patrick and Heidi mentioned about like PASS is a new program and um, and the way we design it is tr we are trying to allow more flexibility there. So when you read the, you know, the notice of funding availability, you, you wouldn't see a lot of restrictions or requirement because again, there are so many type of paths and we want to, you know, lower the barrier instead of increasing the barrier. So yeah, I, I think Todd, if he's available, he can talk more about uh, more challenges he, he encountered, but yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I think we're we're we only have a few more minutes, but I'm just interested if people <clears throat> think um, at all about um, you know when we talk about prevention and other areas. I I feel like again, yes, we want to help people that are experiencing homelessness, and like you know, Secretary Castro mentioned, we're constantly sort of. Um, trying to figure out how to also not just get people housed, but get people in situations where they can actually find, you know, self-sufficiency, stabilize, thrive, you know, in their housing and in their communities. And so to that note, you know, my thought about, um, like, I don't know if HCD has their hands in any, you know, in like general affordable housing and things where we know that pet restrictions you know, still impact the community and, you know, even market rate housing. So just wondering if there are thoughts from anybody around that bigger picture sort of advocacy around pet friendly housing in general and how much that might impact um, what we're doing in the housing and homelessness sector. I don't know if that was clear at all. And since nobody's responding, I'm guessing it wasn't super clear. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I just have a lot of, you know, thoughts around, well, Heidi, you unmuted. So I, that, well, are you, I was just going to clarify, are you really, are you talking about like some of the prevention, um, like housing challenges that lead to people relinquishing their pets in particular, or are you talking about like people who are unhoused, but like there's both. both. Yeah. I'm also talking about people you know, just the general market, you know, when people who are unhoused become regular community members after having been housed and overcoming their trauma, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then just become regular members of the community, our communities are not necessarily pet friendly in the regular, you know, even in the general communities, I'm sure you know, as a dog owner, right? So finding housing, um, even without it being around, you um, folks that are, you know, experiencing homelessness is it the, you know, it's the animal, uh, the animal friendly housing is still not the norm. So. Yeah. And I think there's also, you know, there are layers of what I was talking about too, around even some of the, the structural and institutional barriers that are put in place. So it's not just about finding the pet friendly housing. It's like, and there's an upfront fee that's not refundable and right. there's an extra right. pet rent for whatever reason. And like all of those things that further burden people with needing to find accessible housing um, right. are things that I think we really need to look at. Um, I mean, the other piece is like thinking of 
about how we create more connections with the legal side of things. So mm -hmm. I also, you know, I volunteer at one of the shelters here in LA and we see all the time that people are bringing their pets back because their landlord decided they no longer could have yeah. pets um, because they lost their home and don't know what to do. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity there as well to kind of bring the legal side back in to say like, no, um, what does it actually mean for a landlord to put those restrictions on and how do we make that a little bit more enforceable so that we're coming from the perspective of the person? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Well, I think we're about at the end of our time. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody for being here today and for this great discussion. I feel like we're at the beginning of a precipice, you know, and we're about to see a huge influx of <clears throat> advocacy and change uh, around these issues. Um, and I'm super hopeful being here. And I just really, really appreciate you all taking the time. And uh, as a reminder to folks, we're going into a 15 minute break. So um, if you can reconvene in the room, um, by, oh wait, maybe I'm wrong. Am I wrong with my timing? Somebody tell me. Is it 15 or 30 minutes? Sorry. And uh, we have a 15 minute break, but your session is ending early and so people can enjoy a longer break. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great rest of the session. And so many of these things that we've talked about in this session will be, and Heidi just dropped her um, email in the chat. Um, so nice of her. Um, a lot of the things that we've talked about are going to be, you know, addressed in many of the other conversations we're having. In fact, just, you know, we were just talking about the legal issues and one of those um, folks that does, uh, specifically does that legal work with folks that are being evicted with animals and all of that is in a, another session, I think, right after this. So, Definitely check out your programs and see what's up. And we're really excited that you're here. And thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day.